because this is very strange. I mean, how are you all? <laughs> very strange to have real people here. It's great. Yeah, so um, actually, as of this month, I'm a staff technical writer on the Chrome team at Google, um, content lead for web.dev and the Chrome developers site. Um, so that's super exciting. I'm just sort of getting used to being in a big company after 20 years of freelancer. Um, quite, quite different, <laughs> but I'm, I'm really excited for, for that challenge. So that's kind of what I'm doing, doing at work. And, and what I also do is um, I'm a member of the CSS Working Group and I, I work on CSS and I edit a couple of specs as, as well as try and chip in with other things. So I wanted to start today by taking you back to the early days of using CSS for layout. So those of us who are sort of early adopters, uh, we gave up on our nested tables and we tried to use absolute positioning uh, to do our layout and we quickly realized that meant that we ended up with our footers overlaying our content. So we then moved on to floats and the layout that we wanted to achieve became known as the holy grail. And it looked like this. <laughs> A three-column layout with fixed width sidebars and a flexible middle section uh, with the source in a good order for screen readers because we, you know, we were already thinking about text-based browsers and screen readers and so on. So this was before responsive design. It was before everybody had clever phones and things. So the aim was what we called a liquid layout. So one that would work with all possible screen resolutions, uh, you know, 640 by 480, 800 by 600, and those really lucky people who were on 1024 by 768. And we all dreamed of a time when everybody would have a screen that size. Simpler times. But with responsive design came this new complexity. The need to translate designs created in Photoshop, which is pretty much how everything was built. You know, we'd get a fixed thing, we'd have to turn it into a design. We wanted to translate those into you know, flexible columns. Now, the old liquid designs basically meant just saying to the designers, look, it's only the middle bit that might stretch a bit. I know you might get slightly longer length, line lengths, but it's fine. But once we got to responsive design, you know, we were having to sort of change up the whole layout. Um, and, you know, that, that was quite a jump for people who were designing for the web. And so to try and make that easier, we tried to work out grid layouts, basically. We're like, well, how can we make these grids that we have in our Photoshop design, how can we make that work? for the web. And so we started to get all these kind of these frameworks, layout frameworks, and they started off being pretty simple. Um, this is from the 960 grid system. Anyone used that back in the day? Anyone? Yeah, yeah, you see loads of people were using this. We were going to these sites, we were copying and pasting this stuff and using it in our designs. Um, so we didn't have to worry about maths, basically. And then we got things like Bootstrap and so on, which really, you know, a lot of people were using for the, for the grid, although there were lots of other things that these frameworks were doing. But under the hood, anything that was using a float-based grid was doing the same thing, sizing things in percentages and pushing them around so they looked like a grid. So, you know, something like this. So that's how you get your, your, your grid layout, essentially, using CSS. And, well, there were problems with that. So the biggest problems that people had, you know, you sort of ask people what, what problems you got with layout, um, clearing floats, because that was quite annoying, um, and getting equal height columns, that was also very annoying. And designers could not understand why this was just an impossibility on the web, um, to have one thing as tall as the other. So that was floats. And that, that we were building things and we had the frameworks, it was fine, we were able to do our jobs. Um, but then Flexbox came along. And they, it, Flexbox basically solved all of our problems with floats. Um, it allowed us to create a, a grid which had equal height columns. And it, we didn't have to worry about clearing. That was fantastic. And I think because it solved those problems so well, no one actually looked at what Flexbox was supposed to be for. Everyone just took Flexbox and said, it's Floats Plus. Let's do this stuff much better. We don't have to worry about clearing anymore. You know, Bootstrap rebuilt their grid system using flex. But a flexbox based grid is just like a float based grid. You size things in percentages and you push them around. And so people started having problems with flexbox. Um, this was generally expressed by people saying it was weird and it was hard <laughs> and it didn't do a grid very well. Um, lining things up in two dimensions, that was hard, you know, creating gaps between flex items. You know, it was just a bit weird. So then we got grid layout. 
And so when grid came along, it solved those problems. We could line things up in, in two dimensions. We could make our 12 column or whatever grid much better. Um, and, and that was pretty cool. And you know, I've been building for the web for a very long time. You know, I was, I was just a freelance web developer for a very long time. And I think you know, doing the same things faster and in a less fragile way is really, really good. And that shouldn't be discounted, the fact that these layout methods let us do that. Because there's lots of common patterns that have go back to the dawn of the web. Um, but we miss a lot about these layout methods if we try to use them just to create a better fixed grid. And this thinking about grid as just a better version of Flexbox, um, this comes from this place of not using Flex for what it's good at, what it was designed for. You know, Flexbox, flexible box layout, is for making squishy things. So again, if we look at float-based layouts, um, if you were making a float-based layout, you had to decide how big everything was up front um, and make the boxes that size and then just stick stuff into them. Because if you didn't give things a size, they'd just sort of wrap around like this and look all a bit messy. So what you would do is, you know, you'd give them their percentage size. You'd give, end up giving them all the same width. And so big things would get squashed into small boxes and small things would have loads of space around them. Um, and you could go around and carefully tweak those percentages. But then what happens if the site's translated? What happens if you go into German, for example, and you have enormous words in there? Um, it all breaks, then you have to do another style sheet for that language and things, and that's all really messy. So that's what Flexbox was designed for. You've got a bunch of differently sized things that you don't really know even how big they are. You throw them at that layout method, and it returns the best layout for those things, taking into account how big they are. Now, this is intrinsic sizing. It's layout looking at the natural size of the content and then working out how big it is rather than extrinsic sizing, which is when we create a box and we stuff the content into it. So this intrinsic sizing is the default behavior of Flexbox. So if you want to make a grid of equal sized columns with Flexbox, you basically turn that behavior off. You tell the flex items to ignore their intrinsic size. You basically say you've got no intrinsic size and you go back to stuffing content into predefined boxes. And that's what any Flexbox-based grid is doing. So it's Flexbox that kind of introduced this inside-out, intrinsically-sized layout, but we pretty much ignored it for a few years because we were just so busy looking for a thing that would let us create better grids. So what then of grid layouts? I mean, surely that is just for making fixed columns and plopping things into them. And it certainly can be. Um, sometimes that's, that's definitely what you want. You want to have a, a regular grid and, and lay things out on it. It's really good at that. Grid makes really good demo. Um, you know, I spoke about grid for a very long time before it even landed, and you know, it makes fantastic demo because you can do all this stuff in a couple of lines of CSS. And so we get our nice equally sized grid. But if you look at the template definition that I used more closely, I didn't just use 1FR for each of my tracks. I used this, I used minmax0 1FR. Now the reason I used minmax0 1FR when I wanted a regularly sized grid is because of this. If you use just 1FR and then you place some big thing into one of the tracks, so here I've replaced one of the words with an image of that creature, that track grows to accommodate it. It doesn't stay, you know, in this case, one-sixth of, of the available space. Because grid two is designed to allow for this inside-out sort of sizing. 1FR is actually min-max auto 1FR. So look at the auto size, the intrinsic size of the content, and then share out whatever space is left over. There's a tiny difference in the algorithm between how Grid works this out and Flexbox works this out, which means that you will see this behavior less often in Grid. You will more often in Grid, if you use 1FR, get equal sized um, columns. Uh, but, it, but it's there and it's baked into the, the way that Grid works. So this is really what I mean by layout from the inside out. Our new layout methods start with the size of the content and then work out. And that is completely upside down compared to what we have been doing on the web like forever. 
You know, we've always been defining size and then stuffing stuff into it. And so once you realize that, you can start to do some really neat things. Um, this is kind of my, my favorite little demo. Um, at one time, it was quite hard to do stuff like little decorations, you know, lines either side of a heading that would be responsive, that wouldn't end up sort of squashing the heading into a tiny box in the middle. Um, I do this using um, grid and generated content. So I'm basically making my heading into a grid. Um, the actual heading text goes into the auto size track. I've got two one of our tracks either side, and I'm using some generated content basically to, to put a line in there. You can do that sort of stuff with lots and lots of different little patterns. Um, there's lots of times where you just want to add a bit of decoration. You can do that with grid and it works really nicely. And so the thing about having squishy things and having these layout methods that, that let us do this sort of stuff is then you kind of get this next level of things that people want to be able to do. Because they're like, oh, well, this is cool. Oh, but you know, if we can have these, these nice boxes, what happens if I want their height to be the same as their width? And what you're asking for there is you're asking for aspect ratio. Now, in the past, about the only time that we kind of came up against the need for aspect ratio is when we wanted to put video content onto our pages. And, and probably pretty much everyone has probably come up against this. Now, if you stick, you know, HTML5 video or an image onto a web page, it maintains its aspect ratio. And all through CSS, we're very careful not to stretch and squash um, the aspect ratio of things that have got an intrinsic aspect ratio. The problem comes if I want to embed a YouTube video with an iframe on my responsive page. And I embed that, and it's got a, you know, a flexible width, but what about the height? And then we end up having to use some sort of, uh, maybe use some JavaScript, or you know, what a lot of people have used is, is this thing that we call the padding hack. Um, this, this uses the fact that if you set your padding using percentages, the value used for the block dimension is copied from the inline dimension. It gives you a sort of hacky way to give you the aspect ratio of that box. It most of the time works. When it doesn't work, it's just really problematic and you have to use JavaScript. Um, but that's how we've been dealing with aspect ratios. Um, so we've now got this aspect ratio property, though, that lets us just, like, declare an aspect ratio. So we can now set a box to conform to whatever aspect ratio we might like. Um, so that might be because you've set an explicit size in one dimension of your box, or that size is just being defined by whatever is available, um, and then you'll be able to maintain the aspect ratio. So I mean, that solves your sort of iframe problem. Um, this demo's got a couple of grid tracks, and, and I've dropped boxes that are set to have an aspect ratio. Uh, their width is defined by the track that they're in, so you know, it'd be bigger or smaller, but they always keep their height in the ratio that we've defined. So we have something um, that looks like this. Now the thing with playing with aspect ratio is you can do some really nice things. You can create some really nice patterns by, by sort of you know, setting an aspect ratio on boxes. Uh, and I was sort of noodling around with this little demo. This is basically a figure element. There's three images there and a fig caption. I've given the images a one-one aspect ratio, so the end of a perfect square, no matter you know, how wide they are based, based on the, the screen size, but they're always a square. Um, I'm then using grid to overlay the fig caption uh, across the three. Uh, so I've just turned on the grid there using dev tools. So we've got, you know, a one of our, one of our, one of our three boxes. Um, and then I've got the, the caption um, laid across the bottom. Now, the nice thing about defining aspect ratio, um, it can help you to avoid layout shift. Um, because you can, you can sort of define boxes that you know that you're going to need that size and things can go into them. Um, and in fact, prior to the aspect ratio property appearing in browsers, browsers were already using that property internally to copy the aspect ratio from the width and height that was on the image element. So, and, and they do that. So if you are adding images to a page, it's important to put your width and height back on. I think we all stop doing it when we're doing responsive design because we're like, well, we're sizing it using CSS now. Um, but if you put the width and height onto your images, then the browser takes that and it works like the aspect ratio and it has a placeholder so you don't get that horrible jiggliness, especially on a phone, as all the images load in and take up their space. And that's a really good point to think about what's kind of 
coming into CSS, this idea of, of considering things like layout shift. Because there's this specification called CSS containment. Now, I wrote about this. This contains the contain property. Um, uh, the level one of the spec introduced the contain property. Now, what CSS containment does is it gives you a way to tell the browser that this chunk of content is like a, a sort of a closed box, as it were. Um, nothing outside is going to affect it, and nothing inside that box can affect things outside. Now, that's really useful if you are building, you know, your, your single page app, um, uh, particularly, you know, you're, you're using JavaScript to, to change things on the page. Now, some of the stuff on the page you're not going to change. It's never going to change. It's like, you know, stuff around the side. It, it, it's not going to be touched by the JavaScript. So you can use containment to sort of define areas, and it basically gives the browser a hint that, you know, things aren't going to change in, in, that, in that element, or when things change inside that, it doesn't affect the outside. The browser doesn't, for instance, need to repaint everything every time JavaScript interacts with the page. So that's really useful. So, you know, you, you can use this, you use this contain property, and, you know, you can say contain layout, and that's, no, nothing of the layout is, is going to change. So that is, you know, already there, very useful. You know, everybody should be using that. It's got very few side effects to, to use. But this coming into CSS opened the door to solving something that web developers have been asking for for years. Now, I, for as long as I can remember, I have been, you know, doing these talks, talking to web developers, and I usually say, you know, tell the CSS working group what you want. Let us know what you're interested in. And like a tsunami comes back, container queries. We want container queries. Everybody wants container queries. It's like, it's like you know, that is the one thing. No matter what we give you, you're still going to ask us for container queries. And it looks like we're going to get them. So container queries are basically like media queries, but instead of querying the total size of the viewport and making decisions based on that, you know, you're querying the size of the container that the item is in. Now, the work on this spe specification has been mostly done by Miriam Suzanne, who is doing, uh, you know, an amazing job working through this, this specification. I am just, as usual, the person standing around talking about it and trying to explain it. Um, so, you know, all of the credit for the things that I'm showing you should, you know, should definitely go um, to her and, and, and do, you know, find stuff she's writing about this. There's some of my resources um, to learn more. So I think, you know, the, the sort of need for container queries has come about as people have moved into doing, you know, layouts based on components a lot more. You know, we're using pattern libraries and so on. We're designing components outside of layout, and then we're wanting to drop them into layout. So the, um, the little figure component I showed earlier, now, if the container was, say I dropped that also into a sidebar, for example, um, so the second example here, it's got a constrained width. Now, it works, it goes really tiny, um, but you can't really see the images. Um, now, it's, if, if it's just the whole viewport that's shrinking, well, obviously I can use media queries and, and rebuild it. But if I just want to drop it into a smaller part of the layout, then knowing the viewport size doesn't help me. So that's really what container queries are, are here to help us with. Um, and we can try them out uh, in Chrome. You need, if you search in Chrome flags for uh, enable CSS container queries, the demos I've got here, which are in, in with my links, um, you can actually try out. So now this spec is in development. It's sort of like there's a, there's a test version in Chrome. It may well change yet. It could well like have changed by the time I get home. Um, so, but you know, so, so do keep an eye on, on sort of, you know, what's, what's been said about it, but you can go and you can try, try it out in Chrome. So you need a container. Now, that's whatever is the parent of your component, or a parent, it doesn't have to be a direct parent, the parent of, of the component. And you need to know which dimension you're querying, block, inline, or both. Um, now, I think for most people, it's, it's the inline size, which in English is the width. That's probably what you're going to want to query. Um, you want to know how much available width you've got in order to lay out your thing. So we say container type inline size. So now we've created a container that, you know, we know about the inline size of this thing. Now, when you do that, this is a bit like using the contain property. So you create a containment context, 
it will turn on layout style and inline size containment. So that's exactly in the same way as using the contain property does. Now, this will cause the box to do a couple of things, and you will only notice something visually if you have floats poking out of that box, because they will get contained, like when you get a new block format in context, um, and margins will stop collapsing through. So there's a potential of a layout change when you make something a container in really those two situations. Um, because when something um, is a containment context, it basically keeps everything inside it. Um, nothing can kind of get out, just like when you use the contain property. Um, but a lot of the time, because actually having floats poking out of boxes and margins collapsing through, that's not something we tend to be relying on in our designs. Um, but you might see a change. Um, you can also optionally name a container. So you can give it a name if you want. Um, and that means you can actually query then a container with a specific name rather than just going for the next, the next sort of parent container. Um, so that's option, you can, you can give things a, a name. And then once you've got your container, you can query it. And it's pretty much just like using media queries at that point. Um, so you can see if your container, in this case I'm not using the name, so it's just going to go for the next container that it finds. Um, and then we can do our CSS inside just in the same way that we would do media queries. Um, and that's if you've got a name, you can do, you know, at container, and then the name. The names are just like um, using, say, if you sort of name areas in grid and use an ident, uh, it's the same kind of rules apply for creating your names. You can call them pretty much anything you like, um, and, and it's, it's an ident rather than a string, so they're not quoted. So this is a little demo. Um, I've got three fixed width grid columns and one taking the remaining space. It's one FR. So the reason the last two have turned blue is that the third is in a 300 pixel grid track and the fourth uses FR units and resolving to greater than 220 pixels. So that's just allowing, we're just sort of checking and, and using container queries there to change the color um, as a little test. But if we look at the example I was showing you um, before, you can see here how I've got a, a, a different display of that example. And I'm pretty much in this example, and it, you can go and have a look at it with, with my resources. I'm pretty much doing this like when you do like a mobile first layout. And so I'm sort of deciding my small layout first, um, creating that. So this is a two column grid layout. And then when I have got enough space, then I will use the, the larger layout, the one that I created before. So I think that the minute you get your hands on this, it's going to be so familiar from using media queries because essentially it works in just the same way. But you're you know, querying the container rather than the, um, than the viewport. Um, and you can combine the two, of course. You can have things that, that are using media queries and container queries. To so say, you know, seems pretty straightforward. And I think what a lot of people are going to be saying is, hang on, why is this taking years? <laughs> what were you doing? And I think the thing is that although this is specification-wise relatively simple, we just couldn't have done it a few years ago. Like a lot of the complex layout stuff we're now able to do, a lot of this is built on the fact that browsers have just got a lot better. The thing about handing over something like container queries is that it is simple and it's really useful and we're all going to use it all over the place. And if that had then slowed everything to a crawl and made all, you know, web pages just respond awfully, that wouldn't be very good, <laughs> you know. So something that we care about a lot when we're adding, you know, web platform features is, you know, is it, is it going to work well? Is it going to perform well? You know, are we not doing something that is going to make the web worse? Um, and so that's really what we've been waiting for. We've been waiting for browsers to get to a point when we can do this without making the web worse. Um, and that really, I think, is, is, is why, you know, for a long time, that was, that was why we didn't do container queries, was just, well, how would we do this and it perform well? Um, and, and your browsers have been doing a lot of work to give us the ability to do new cool stuff. Um, so Chrome have been working on this, on this project at rendering NG, um, this sort of the rewrite of, of the engine. 
Um, and the sort of part that's most of interest to, to me and, and to people who care about CSS and CSS layout is the part called Layout NG. Um, this is a, a post um, on the Chrome Developers blog, sort of doing a, a real dig. There's actually a, a big series of these posts which are quite technical but, but really quite interesting um, in terms of how, you know, how rendering NG is making some things possible that weren't possible before and speeding up a bunch of stuff that we already have like grid layouts, for example, um, and fixing a load of bugs, you know, sort of weird bugs in Flexbox, and so there's little things that you might hit up against, um, things in fragmentation, um, which, which have been difficult to do in the past. You know, all this sort of stuff is getting fixed um, through Layout NG, so that's really exciting. Loads of table bugs and stuff. There's loads of really weird bugs in, in table layout, um, you know, that you can run into. These sort of things um, are being fixed. So, uh, you know, I would recommend going and if you've got a bit of an interest in how browsers do this stuff and, and you know how we're getting things in browsers. These posts are really interesting. So that's really why it's taken a long time. It's not because the CSS working group hate you, it's because <laughs> this stuff's just hard and potentially causes all sorts of problems. And what we want to do is be able to give you stuff that is going to be really cool and work really well. So there's a few other bits and bobs. Um, so you could, there's a shorthand which lets you specify you know, the type of containment and the name um, using that forward slash syntax that we see in grid layout as well. You can do things like block size. Now, this is a little bit in flux at the moment, or even in the spec. I, I, was, I was asking Miriam a few questions about it because I had some kind of components in mind that I can't quite build yet, and uh, they, they, would, they sort of rely on, on block containment. Now, the thing about querying um, the block dimension well, the thing about the web generally is we don't actually tend to know how tall things are. That's been a kind of a, a good maxim of web development and design. Um, you know, you can control how wide things are, but you never know how tall anything is on the web. And especially when we go back to floats, uh, we, we, we never knew how tall things were going to turn out. Um, the thing is, when you query the um, block dimension, it's a bit like when you use containment in the block dimension. If you use size containment, you're basically saying, I know how big this thing is. I know how tall this thing is, if you're talking about block in English. Um, now, if you see, if you haven't set an explicit height on the thing, then it basically acts like it's got no size, so it all kind of collapses down. Um, that is, that's just what happens with containment, because actually there isn't a size to that thing. It's just getting as tall as it is for the content. Um, but I know that's something that was sort of is, is being thought about, you know, ways around, you know, how to deal with that well. So, container queries, you know, are coming. Now, I, I say that, and I have to remember, I was the person who talked about grid layout on stage for five full years before it launched. So I've got something of a track record <laughs> in CSS vaporware. So. I do believe they're coming. Um, I, I imagine it's probably going to be a couple of years, really, by the time. I mean, we, you know, we've already heard a bit about Safari and things and um, how long it takes for things to get into browsers. But it does take a while for things to get into browsers. And we can't, you know, browser teams are busy and, and they have their own um, things to be working on. And, and, you know, how quickly stuff will land across browser, I don't know. And even how quickly the spec is ready, really, for it to come out from behind a flag in Chrome, I don't know that either. But then they are coming. Um, and, but what I really wanted to sort of show with this talk and the progression I went through is that I don't want people to wait for this thing they think is going to solve all their problems to come. Because I think actually, within existing layout methods, an awful lot of what you want out of container queries you can already do. Because of the way that um, you know, these new layout methods can sort of do sizing and can respond to what's inside them and outside them. There's an awful lot of stuff you can do with creating flexible components just by using Grid and Flexbox in an intelligent way and really looking at what they're meant to do. And that understanding will help you even once you've got container queries because they will help you do fallbacks. Because, it, you know, say, say they land in Chrome and you think, well, you know, a lot of our users are using Chrome. Let's start to use container queries as an enhancement. But you're still going to want to use something as a fallback um, for your container queries. Um, and it's also going to help you to not clutter your code with lots and lots of queries because we know from media queries, you know, if you're using loads and loads of media queries, it gets quite complicated. And so if you add to that the container queries, you're adding a lot of complexity. So if you can just use layout methods as they are and, and, and use what we've got before you start to add in the queries, I think you're going to have 
you know, much more straightforward CSS. Um, you're not going to be creating a lot of extra complexity. So remember that Flexbox is designed for flexible things, you know, a bunch of different sized items with an unknown container size. It's really good at that sort of stuff. Use intrinsic and range sizing methods with grid. Look at the different ways that you can size, you know, tracks and elements and so on in, in grid. And don't restrict grid to being only used for like the whole layout of your page. It's great for components. Um, you know, that, that little header, you know, making a heading into a grid. Um, that might see if you have in your mind that grid is, you know, only for making fixed grids, you miss out on a lot of this really neat stuff where you can use it for small components. Um, so do remember that. But do get excited for container queries. Try it out. Enable the flag in Chrome. See if the things you've had in your head when you've been thinking, I wish we had container queries, see if it works for them. And if it doesn't, you know, raise an issue with, with the CSS working group. You know, ask me on Twitter or, or, or one of the other people working on the spec. Talk to us because this is the chance to make it this the sort of specification that we really need. This is the time to offer that feedback. So, so please do. Please try the stuff out that people are, are, are showing you um, and let us know what you think. And thank you very much. It is wonderful to be back in front of a real audience and I hope you have been enjoying this conference. <laughs>